Director of Sus Sustainable Landscape Professional Certificate Program at Sonoma State University. Um, and she holds a Master's in, of Science in Biology with an emphasis on ecological principles of sustainable landscape. So that's kind of what you would expect. Uh, she currently lectures, teach, and works as a consultant. And, and as I said, those 10 years of columns in, in Pacific Horticulture were just uh, wonderful. So uh, she, her book is here today. Uh, afterwards, we can have uh, sales and signing. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but I know that she said that. So let's have a warm welcome for Frederick. Okay. Short people. Hello? No? Okay. There we go. So thank you so much for that uh, lovely introduction. And I'm really happy to be here again in Orange County. You have a great group of people down here. And um, before I move forward with slides, I want to mention that the book has illustrations by Craig Latker. He's a landscape architect and an artist. Um, and he, I've been working with him for many years now. There's over 150 illustrations in the book and a number of them are new for the book. And this particular drawing is for my next book, which is about how to create habitat. Um, so these are native longhorn bees here on sunflowers. And photo credits are on the photos and if there isn't a credit, it's because it's my photo or maybe I forgot. Now, um, so I, I first of all want to say, what is a garden ally? I think most of us think about pollinators when we're thinking about garden allies. And today, although I will talk about pollination, um, I'm really going to be focusing more on things like decomposers and predators and parasites, um, other organisms in the garden. And I am going to delve into some science but first of all, I'm going to share some more of Craig's pretty drawings and um, tell you that after I get through the science, we're going to meet some of these different organisms and um, in this order. So we are going to talk about life beneath our feet. That is always the beginning of anything about gardens. We're going to talk about flower visitors. And I specifically don't have a chapter on pollinators because there are a lot of insects that visit. Okay, there's a lot of insects that visit flowers and other animals that visit flowers that are actually not pollinating. We're gonna dig a little deeper into what is the difference between a predator and a parasite and a parasitoid. Huh? We're going to meet the beetles. Garden commons is like that closet that you have where you throw everything, you don't know quite where to put it. Garden commons. The ground crew and beyond is going to include some other organisms that you can find in the garden that are not insects, generally. And the vertebrates. So now let's dive in. Um, how many of you have heard of integrated pest management, first of all? Ah, good, okay. Integrated pest management was actually developed for agriculture, commercial greenhouses. Um, it's a decision support system for the selection and use of pest control tactics. It's based on cost benefit analyses. It takes into account producers, society, and the environment. So as gardeners, our cost-benefit analysis is not quite what it is if we were trying to earn our living off of um, our gardens or greenhouse. Um, we have an aesthetic threshold. This chart is really using a damage level to decide whether to move on to the next stage. So we're going to focus on biological control. There's actually three kinds of biological control, and I'm going to briefly um, tell you what those are. With classical biological control, which is what most of us are usually thinking of, we are introducing the natural enemy of a non-native pest. 
Okay. And that enemy is native to the same place as the pest. And we are hoping to permanently establish this natural enemy. And this here is Charles Valentine Riley. He was the chief of the Division of Entomology of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And um, here in Southern California, the citrus industry was endangered by this cottony cushion scale that was at the bottom, it's in the bottom slide here. And it just looks like a little ball of fluff. And it was destroying the citrus industry turn of the last century, okay? So end of the 18s, early 1900s. And he had this brilliant idea. I'm, Where is this thing from? Oh, it's from Australia. We need to go there. And he asked his boss, could he go to Australia and look for natural enemies? And his boss said, no way. So he sent a staff member on the pretext of going to an exposition that was being held in Australia with a secret mission, go find natural enemies. And his staff member came back with the Vidalia beetle, which is related to ladybugs, and a parasitic fly. And it was incredibly successful. Um, later on, we found out that classical biological control is really only effective in perennial systems like orchards, for instance. And now it's quite expensive because when we're bringing in something from another country, we do extensive testing now to make sure that it isn't going to switch to a different host. And that can be especially important when we're using an insect to control weeds. You might be bringing in an insect, say, to control an invasive grass, but we don't want it to then switch to our own native perennial grasses. Yeah. Augmentative biological control is where we're introducing natural enemies, which could be native or non-native, and it's only for temporary control of the pest. So this can also be expensive if you're purchasing insects, right? And um, there are two different strategies, and ladybugs belong in the second strategy of inundation, where you're releasing them in large numbers, you're expecting a reduction in the pest, which isn't gonna happen when you buy those ladybugs. And um, you're really using these insects as a biopesticide. Okay? And um, if I need to convince you to not buy ladybugs, look under those little mesh bags that you see sometimes being sold and you'll see it looks like black confetti on the ground. Those are ladybug legs. So here's what I favor for gardening especially. Conservation biological control. We're preserving and enhancing our locally resident natural enemies. They aren't always native. We have introduced some wonderful little parasitic wasps in different agricultural systems especially that are now ubiquitous. So we can just appreciate them. This is the only way you can do pest management that creates a positive feedback loop. Right? You're reducing pesticides, so natural enemies are increasing, so you have less need for pesticides. So a lot of ecosystem benefits to this kind of pest regulation. Okay? Of course, pollination, by reducing pesticides, you're protecting your pollinators. And then all these other things. Um, and ultimately, what we're looking for is long-term sustainability of our human-managed systems. So um, why native plants? Probably this audience already knows why native plants. As you heard, I worked at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. It was an all native plant botanic garden. And I was already a fan of native plants before I started working there, but um, it increased my appreciation for them from working there. And especially, see we have some plants here. One of them is an oak tree, okay? 800 species of insects eat oaks, okay? at least. Those are just the ones that are eating oak trees and they're eating every single part. They're eating the leaves, the twigs, they're under the bark, they're feeding on roots. But we don't really notice them. We notice birds. And so I always like to point out insects are really good at hiding because they're really good food for a lot of other things. And this is all based on coevolution. Okay. And coevolution, um, this term that is really familiar to us all, was um, popularized by Paul Ehrlich and Peter Raven. One is an entomologist and the other is a botanist. And they wrote their most famous paper, Butterflies and Plants, a study in coevolution, 
sitting at a coffee table, comparing what they were doing. And what they discovered, there was really close relationship between the speciation of insects and their associated plant species. Okay. And um, fascinating, this paper was really about caterpillars, not butterflies. But even Paul Ehrlich and Peter Raven were influenced by the fact that we love butterflies and maybe not so much caterpillars. Um, so this leads to what we call an evolutionary arms race. And a familiar example, of course, is the monarch butterfly. The caterpillar is eating this toxic plant. So the toxic plant has to become more toxic so that it can avoid being eaten. So the monarch caterpillars then evolve to be able to overcome that toxicity. Hence, evolutionary arms race. And this also is leading to not only speciation, but specialization. So herbivorous insects are closely linked with the plants with which they evolved. Okay. This is really why we need native plants. Sometimes they will eat congeners, which are related plants from other places often. Okay. Many parasitoids and predators are actually also closely linked to the prey that they are eating. So the bottom line is that native plants are really superior in supporting biodiversity. And I'm often asked, well, how many native plants do I need in my garden? And people have different numbers they're thinking about, maybe you know, 30%, 50%. It is very rare to find a gardener who actually has 100% native plants that are native to their region. And if you do, more power to you. Um, but if hydrangeas remind you of your grandmother and you want one and it provides no useful habitat for anything, have a hydrangea. Um, so herbivorous insects, okay, actually half of all biodiversity on this planet. Okay? And we always start out with the plants, right? Plants are converting the sun's energy and they're providing nutrients for pretty much everything on this planet. Um, and 90% of all herbivorous insect species are specialists. Okay? And um, yeah, I got a lot of these figures, by the way, from Doug Tallamy's books. He wrote a book called Bringing Nature Home and made the case for why we need herbivorous insects in a really articulate and gardener-friendly manner. Um, so if you haven't seen his book, he's written several others since, um, really helpful. And that role in the food web is really rarely discussed in horticulture. Um, and we're kind of getting used to the idea, much as with organic food, where hmm, may have some imperfections. We're getting used to these imperfections in the garden. So for those of you who don't like insects, you probably like birds, right? How many people like birds? Yeah, pretty much everybody, right? Um, so 96% of birds are feeding their babies arthropods, insects and related species. And we do tend to think of birds as seed eaters, right? We put out bird food, it's bags of seed, but actually a lot of them would love it if you put out a big plate full of mealybugs for them. Um, and a lot of them continue to eat arthropods as adults. Okay? Half their diet is moths and butterfly caterpillars. We have some caterpillars back here in a little container. And those moths and butterflies tend to be really closely connected with the plants with, that they feed upon. So everything is connected, right? You tug at one little piece of the food web and it is reverberating throughout that web. So we want a healthy garden. So we know now that we need to promote biodiversity. Okay? But what is that really? Okay? We use a lot of words without thinking about what the definition really is. So I want to spend a few minutes and define biodiversity. Okay? Usually when we're thinking about biodiversity, we are thinking about species richness. Okay? That's simply the number of species present in an environment. But if you only have one individual of each of a thousand species, you really do not have a healthy environment. Okay? So ecologists also like to take in abundance, which is the number of individuals of each species. 
that is present. And by the way, I did not know this when I started to study ecology, but ecology is really math rich. And there's a lot of math involved. There are a lot of different ways to calculate biodiversity. Something that matters to us in our gardens is functional biodiversity, where we're not just looking at richness and abundance, but what is the identity of each of these species and what is their ecological role? Sometimes we talk about insurance species and how they provide a high functional group biodiversity. What that means is that if you have, say, uh, 15 different organisms that like to eat aphids, and it isn't just insects, right? We hummingbirds um, like to eat aphids too and feed them to their babies. And so if, say, you had five species of lady beetles and they all like to eat aphids, these particular five species, Maybe one of them dies out because of a pathogen or some other environmental reason. Um, but then you have four other species that are going to be able to, to fill that spot. And that leads to your ecosystem, your garden, being resilient and um, able to bounce back from a disturbance. And if you're a gardener, you're always disturbing your environment. There's a lot of factors that promote biodiversity. And um, interestingly, these are all features of gardens. Um, and it, this, so actually having conservation biological control in a big agricultural system can really be a challenge. And it's why we're seeing farms starting to put in hedgerows, right, and a habitat for insects. But these are all factors that you are going to find in your garden. So let's move on. How do insects feed on plants? So these are all pollinators here, and they're feeding on plants. Right? They're feeding on nectar. We don't usually think of them as plant feeders because they're not doing damage, right? Okay. This is usually what we're thinking about. We've got some caterpillars over here on the left, and they're really well hidden, by the way. A lot of caterpillars feed at night. Okay. They're juicy and plump and delicious for, to a lot of animals, and so they find different ways to hide. Swallowtail butterflies, for instance, look like a bird poop in their early stages, and they'll be on top of a leaf. These caterpillars here like to line up under the midrib um, of the leaves and can be quite hard to spot. And then on the right here is a clarkia in my garden, and it has little ovals missing out of the petals. Okay. So those were made by a leaf cutter bee, okay? family Megachilid. And um, so it's also a pollinator. It's an important pollinator. But here it's making holes. Sometimes they like rose leaves too and red bud leaves. And, and um, so you'll see these holes. So is this a beneficial insect? Is it a pest? Depends maybe. Um, so as much as possible, and I'm not always successful, I try and use terms having to do with ecology. It's prey, predator, parasitoid, decomposer. I try not to think as much in terms of whether something is a pest or beneficial. Now, sometimes in your garden, things will be a pest, right? And um, often those are from somewhere else. We're also, though, seeing as climate change is gathering speed that um, a number of native insects are also becoming problematic as the, as the climate changes. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now to some of the critters that are um, in the garden. So beneath our feet, I have a reading. Again, the air into which plants extend their stems, leaves, flowers, and fruit is a virtual desert compared to the soil in which their roots seek anchorage, water, and nourishment. This is why the health and sustainability of any landscape begins with stewardship of its most valuable resource, the soil underfoot. Soil is not simply a canvas on which we paint our beautiful plant picture, but a living substrate. A good gardener, before anything else, tends the soil, the foundation of the landscape. We think that we are growing plants, but really we are growing soil. When we proudly show off our prized tomatoes, we could just as proudly show off a handful of the fertile soil from whence they came. 
Fertile soil includes a complement of humus, organic matter that has decomposed until it has reached a stable state. We have many garden allies, seen and unseen, to thank for that. As Leonardo da Vinci remarked long ago, we know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. It is still true today. Just about every available surface under our feet is teeming with life. Incredibly, even the thin film of water that coats soil particles and lines pores in the soil harbors microscopic organisms that navigate those minute spaces. Fascinating stories emerge from the soil. So there are a lot of fascinating stories about all the things that I will talk about in the next few minutes. And clearly, I don't, I don't have enough time to tell you all of them. So let's look first at microscopic and unnoticed life. And I love this illustration. It's the only one that was not done by Craig Lacker. It was done by a friend of mine, Jim Nardi wrote a book called Life in the Soil, A Guide for Naturalists and Gardeners. And it has a really excellent section at the beginning talking about how soil is formed. One of the things that Jim says is, hey, without life, it's just crushed rock. Okay? It is life that acts on this, um, along with a little bit of freeze and thaw and uh, you know, some other external things. But it's basically life. It is amazing to me, a cup of undisturbed native soil, what it actually contains. And when you see this 200 million bacteria and um, you know, 50,000 arthropods okay, in a cup of soil. So many of these are microscopic, fun to look at. Yeah. Then we have earthworms. Uh, you may know night crawlers are not native. Um, we appreciate them when they're in our gardens. Um, that's an earthworm egg on the right here. A single earthworm can produce 10 pounds of castings a year. That's a huge amount of worm manure. And in addition to enriching your soil, they are accelerating decomposition. Their, their tunnels are creating channels for the penetration of water and nutrients and um, other critters, um, water. And this is why I'm a big fan of no-till. Okay? I don't want to chop up the earthworms, but I also don't want to mess with the structure of the soil. Okay? So as much as possible, I don't do that. And every once in a while, somebody says, oh, I just moved to this property, and it's you know, hard crust. And sure, you could just pile compost on it and wait, but it, you may not want to wait 10 years. So sometimes we till. Sometimes we add mycorrhizal fungi to a really impoverished soil. Generally, you don't need those. Um, so, decomposers and nutrient facilitators, often the same thing, right? Because in decomposing, they're making nutrients available. Um, mushrooms, we were just talking about mycorrhizae, are a familiar example. We have a number of plants that fix nitrogen. This is a leguminous plant on the right. And these little structures that the plant creates that the bacteria are housed in are really to, they're trying to wall off that bacteria. And this is really a type of gall. Um, and as this plant's root system decomposes, it releases the nitrogen, which is then available for other plants. Okay. So, oops, we're gonna go on to, on the wing, flower visitors. Interestingly enough, the only non-native butterfly I even know about is um, the cabbage butterfly. Our butterflies are native insects. Um, what I find is a lot of entomologists are a bit scornful of butterflies. They're too pretty, they're too easy, that you can find them too easily. And a lot of entomologists will specialize in tiny, obscure things that you may not have noticed. Um, so one of the interesting things about, so we're gonna talk about bees very briefly. I brought a few bees. Um, they are our best and most important pollinators. Yeah. And one of the reasons is that they have branched hairs and they have an electrostatic charge 
So they're like pollen magnets. Okay? They land on a flower and the pollen actually just gets gathered up. They're also the only insect that is purposefully gathering pollen and nectar and taking it back to their nest. Okay? So very important. There are 4,000 species in the United States. Okay? We have 1,600 native species in California alone. And they are especially diverse in um, desert and arid environments. So you probably have a lot of native bees. I only brought a few, but you will notice that some of them are really, really tiny. Or they're metallic. They're not what you expect when you're thinking bee. And um, most of them are solitary. So they're not aggressive. 70% solitary. 70% are ground nesters not necessarily overlapping. Yeah. Most of them are stingless, and by the way, only females can sting. Okay. Uh, a lot of these small bees couldn't even penetrate skin. Okay. These ones on the left, by the way, those are longhorn sunflower bees, and those are males. Solitary bee nests are made by the females, and they provision their nests and the males don't have anywhere to sleep at night. And so this was in my front yard. Um, my neighbors all thought I was nuts because I was out there with the camera on my knees every single evening because they all gather in the same place. Yeah, I see Bob back there has experience with them too. They're very cool. So moths and butterflies. We are really familiar with butterflies, but 90% of the Lepidoptera are actually moths. Okay? So butterflies are out in the day when we are. They tend to be colorful. A lot of moths are tiny little things. Micro Lepidoptera, they call them. Really small, they're brown, they're inconspicuous. We don't really notice them. So interestingly, most butterflies are actually not great pollinators. And if you look at them, you know, we, monarch butterfly, you can go to botanic gardens around the country. Monarch butterflies are the star of the pollinator garden, um, but they're not good pollinators. They're perched way up above the flowers, and uh, you know they put down that long proboscis, and they're sipping nectar. And um, there are reasons why monarch butterflies are important, but it isn't due to pollination. Okay. So there are skippers. And you've probably seen them bouncing around. They're usually some kind of color of rust or brown. And they're kind of in between, evolutionarily, the butterflies and the moths. And they can be pretty good pollinators, as can some moths. Okay. So I have hunting wasps in this category of, um, of flower visitors. And that's because the hunting wasps actually feed on nectar and occasionally pollen as adults. I have some wasps in another chapter too. But the hunting wasps are defined by the fact that they can carry prey. Okay? A lot of them are solitary. And um, the wasp larvae are carnivorous as opposed to the bee larvae. And so these hunting wasps are capturing prey, paralyzing it, and carry it back to their nest so that prey stays alive until the wasp larva can hatch out. And they often will eat very discriminately, and they leave the vital organs for last, so their prey stays alive. <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot of um, really cool, gross things about insects. Um, <laughs> I was once told not to tell a classroom of children about how, yeah, and then there will be 20 little wasps will hatch out, and then the brother mates with his 19 sisters. And, and yeah, it's like, oh no, don't tell that story. Okay. So we see a lot of flies visiting flowers. And this is one of the ways, actually, that you can learn a lot about what beneficial insects are out there for you, because most of these flower visiting insects, not all, most of them are, are something that you would welcome into your garden. And a lot of the fly, that's true of a lot of the flies. So if you see really bristly flies, and I brought some tachinids today for you to look at, and they're real bristly. 
those are a fantastic fly. And, um, and then the surfeit flies, hover flies, flower flies, which are usually bee or wasp mimics, and they come in all different sizes. We often don't notice really teeny things. Um, one of the things that I do like to um, mention, because people will tell me, well, I planted rosemary and it's covered with bees. Sure it is, honeybees. And also, we're not trained to notice what's absent. Okay? So if you planted a native plant, we have some here that are really attractive um, to insects. You might not notice that where are the little tiny bees? I planted something exotic, and, and so you wouldn't notice. Okay, this right here, a ridgeron. Okay, um, you might think of this as a daisy, right? This is really a head of flowers, okay? It's, it's not just one flower. It's maybe hundreds of flowers in one head, okay? And one way to think about that is sunflower heads, right? Each sunflower seed came from a single flower. So I like to have a range of Asteraceae, which is the daisy family, um, in any garden where I want to attract insects. I like close focusing binoculars very much because you can just sit in a chair and watch the activity in your garden. They're great for watching hummingbirds uh, and other birds, um, butterflies, bees. I brought a hand lens too, they're often recommended. But if insects are alive, you're going to have a hard time chasing them around with a hand lens, right? Um, so um, maybe you could see aphids or things that are sitting still. Okay. So this particular photograph is of a California native. This is Epipactus um, gigantea, which is the California stream orchid. And this photograph was sent to me some years ago uh, by a friend who said, hey, what kind of bee is that? Well, it's a fly. I could tell by the funny little antennae. Orchids have all kinds of interesting pollination mechanisms, right? And this one is slapping these little packets of pollen, pollinia, onto the back of this fly. It gets triggered as it goes in. And this fly has so many pollinia on it that I don't know how it is even able to fly anymore. <laughs> it's a cool relationship. And these relationships between native um, species of insects and plants can be really interesting. Yeah. Digging deeper, predators and parasites and parasitoids. Yeah. So this here is a robber fly. I actually brought a robber fly with me. They are a ferocious predator. They kill and eat a lot of individuals. Yeah. That's a predator. And um, one of the reasons why so many insects are good at hiding is because there is a strong force of selection on insects to protect themselves from predators through a variety of strategies, All right? Oops, what happened here? Okay. So what is the difference, really, between parasites and parasitoids? Because you'll hear that term when it comes to insects. So parasite is on or inside its host, it's usually far smaller than the host. It rarely kills its host because it's bound to it for it, its survival. Although, especially as a larva, it might move from one host to another, and there are some really complicated relationships that can happen there. Whereas a parasitoid adult might be lo much larger than the host, and it is laying its eggs there, either on or inside its host. And a key is that it has a free living adult stage. It's almost always an insect. Usually it is a species of fly or wasp. And these are really useful in the garden, right? And they kill their host with very few exceptions. Biology is full of exceptions. And so I'm always qualifying everything I say. So here we have the flies. Okay? The bristly tachinid here on the left is a parasitic fly. And the bee fly, Bombyliidae here, is a um, parasitic fly as well. And it is parasitizing ground nesting bees and wasps. 
So, you know, again, we come into these, oh, nature is complicated. I, I, I actually want those bees and wasps, but the bee fly is a good pollinator. So, um, so these parasitoid wasps are incredibly tiny. There's certainly nothing to fear. And when I was studying, I studied parasitoids as part of my master's. I went down to the California Academy of Sciences, with my little box of wasps, and I showed them to Bob Sparko, who was an expert on these things, and said, hey, look at my little wasps. And he said, oh, let me show you some small wasps. And he pulled out a microscope slide, and under that cover slip, there must have been 50 wasps. I mean, you couldn't even see them. And I realized that some of those things that I thought were just dust motes floating around my plants are wasps. And so, very cool, and certainly to be welcomed. Um, it's a great project with kids is to go out at the end of the season and look under the sunflower leaves um, at the aphids there. You will find some parasitized specimens. They're either tan or black, usually, the different colors than the living aphids. And if they don't have a little hole at the back where the adult wasp emerges, um, you can put them in a gelatin capsule like this or a jar, and after a few days, the little wasp emerges. Um, children like to do that. Sometimes adults like to do that. Um, while I was studying for my master's, I think the local store was wondering what kind of drugs I was putting into all those gelatin capsules. Um, and, um, there we go. Hey, okay, meet the beetles. Okay. So there are uh, more beetles than any other kind of insect. For a long time, we said there are more weevils than any other kind of beetle, but now I think that rogue beetles are winning that competition at this time. Lots and lots of rogue beetles. I brought a couple to look at, too. Um, this particular individual is in an ornate checkered beetle. That's in the family clarity, and I think I brought uh, one with me. They're very conspicuous, and they're predaceous as both adults and larvae. They eat other beetles, they eat other insects, and you know, we're looking at some of these um, potentially to combat um, bark beetles. The interesting thing is that the larvae eat larvae, and the adults eat adults. Um, so a lot of beetles, I only brought a small selection of beetles, a lot of them really like these late summer blooms like goldenrod, which does not cause hay fever, by the way, pollen's too heavy, it's insect pollinated. Um, they like things with clusters of small flowers, yarrow, for instance. And another important thing, and you'll see I brought, I have a grass, I have a grass here, um, melica grass, is that the grasses produce a lot of early season pollen that is important, not just for beetles, but for some other insects. So lady beetles, okay? This is what we're usually thinking about, red, black polka dots, okay? But to the right here is a mealybug destroyer. It's a very small beetle, and the larvae look like mealybugs. It's the classic story of the wolf in sheep's clothing, right? They just are able to collect their meals uninterrupted. So I have this little box here. It's got five different kinds of ladybugs in it for you to look at. Some of them are just the size of a pinhead. Okay. So yes, you can buy certain lady beetles. Convergent lady beetle, for instance, and you can buy, like you can buy mealybug destroyers. But by just having a garden with an abundance of flowers, and they do feed on uh, pollen and maybe occasionally nectar as adults, you're going to attract all kinds of species to your garden. And it's really a better way to go than to purchase the ones that are just going to fly away. Soldier beetles. Um, so soldier beetles, you have some pretty big soldier beetles here in Southern California. And one of the things I don't like about, there's some, you know, little guides floating around there, good bug, bad bug, right? And they put blister beetles on the bad bug side, which I would not actually put them there. But they have it on the bad bug side, and blis the blister beetles that they tend to illustrate look a lot like soldier beetles, to which they're related. But soldier beetles are a predator, a predator as larvae and as adults. And they are one of the reasons why I don't like to mess too much with leaf litter where I can leave it, because a lot of these beneficials 
are in the leaf litter as larvae, or that's where they pupate. And so it's good to try and leave that alone. And soldier beetles are a fantastic garden ally. And when, when I wrote the original essay on this, and my essays all got vetted by somebody who was an expert on that group, um, the expert on soldier beetles was really excited. Oh, we don't get any press on soldier beetles. This is so awesome. Um, so, um, you know, take a look around your garden and you will see these visit, they often found visiting flowers. And they will prey on all kinds of things, right? Aphids, caterpillars, grasshopper eggs, mites. And I hear that they like cucumber beetle eggs. So all I know is my garden doesn't really have any cucumber beetles anymore uh, to speak of. Here is a predaceous ground beetle. So um, you can see this guy has huge mandibles, okay? And they're hunters and they run. And I did bring some look-alikes, a couple of live ones actually, the um, darkling beetles. So whether it's a predaceous ground beetle or a darkling beetle, we often don't notice them because they're out at night. Most insects are actually nocturnal, okay? And so these guys come out at night to hunt. And the darkling beetles come out to eat vegetation. So the vegetarians tend to be quite slow moving and they're grazing and the carnivorous beetles are running about hunting in this case. And so I do have some good examples you can look at and this is where behavior can really clue us about something. Much harder to tell the difference once they're dead. Okay. So leaf beetles, I have them here. As these particular beetles here are a type of um, chrysomelid, which is um, the family Chrysomelidae. It's an herbivorous family, but they're useful in weed control. Okay? These particular beetles here were introduced to control St. John's wort, Hypericum perforatum, which is a rangeland weed that is toxic to cattle. And it's been really successful. Now I think we're trying to introduce a weevil for star thistle. Right? But as I said, you know, these things are always being tested, tested, tested. We don't want the weevil to then start eating our native thistles. Okay. So I'm going to pass this around. This is a buprested. Nobody would call this a beneficial insect, I'm thinking, but it is perhaps our most beautiful beetle, okay? We call them jewel beetles. So um, you're unlikely to see them in your garden. We might see some around here. Okay, the garden commons, familiar garden insects. This is one of my very favorites. This is an ambush bug. And so as opposed to the other predatory insects I was talking about, we have quite a few that are um, sit and wait predators, and they just hang out and wait for the food to come to them. And you can find these oftentimes on goldenrod late in the year, I'll, I'll see these um, sitting and waiting. So the garden commons is going to include a lot of things that we're not going to cover today, true bugs, lace wings, dragonflies, mantises, and more. Um, so what is a bug anyway? Okay. I, um, I do use the word bug because it's such a convenient word, right? And, um, you know, roly polies are actually a crustacean. Kids call them bugs, millipedes bugs, um, you know, mosquitoes bugs. So I do use that word, but if you're an entomologist, and you'll hear entomologists use this term, a true bug, okay? Because a bug is really just one kind of insect, and it's distinguished by having piercing, sucking mouth parts, whether it's predatory, like this fellow on the left, or on the right here, um, it wants to suck on plant juice. And you can see that oftentimes they have that piercing sucking mouth part kind of lays down underneath their abdomen when it's not sticking out and being used. And this red and black coloring that you frequently see, much like bees, black and yellow coloring is a warning, okay? This is called aposematic coloring. It's saying, don't mess with me, okay? Because I could bite you or I might taste bad. You know, ladybugs, that red and black coloring is saying, I taste really awful and if you don't believe me, come take a bite. And um, the ladybugs actually exude this noxious fluid from what you might think of as their knees. Okay. 
So here's a group. I should just say homopteran group here. It used to be that we had all these true bugs neatly divided into the hemiptera and the homoptera. But then, you know, as we are learning more about the relationships between organisms due to all the DNA work we do now, we said, oh, these are actually not that closely related, and they've split them up into three groups for now. And, um, but it's useful as a gardener to think of them together because these are some of our most problematic garden insects, right? They include scale insects and white flies and mealybugs and... Um, our favorite little chickens of the garden aphids. Um, so oftentimes, if you're having an issue with some of these on a plant, say you have an orange tree and you've got all kinds of uh, mealy bugs on it, look closer. Do you have ants? Because the Argentine ants farm these kinds of insects because they feed on the sugar. So sometimes, by controlling the ants, what will happen is that it allows all the predators and the parasitic insects to come in and attack the pest that you're trying to get rid of. And actually in this photo on the right, the photo on the right here, there's, a, there's an ant headed towards this ladybug to attack it. Ants are really vicious, okay? and it will attack this because it's protecting its little herd of aphids. Odonata is the dragonflies and damselflies. Now, damselflies tend to stay pretty close to water, but dragonflies will range widely. And they are just as much fun to look at in your garden as the hummingbirds that you're trying to attract. This one here had just emerged, and so that's why it's sitting quietly on my hand. They will eat their weight in mosquitoes daily. Okay. And the larvae eat mosquito larvae. Uh, so they're a really fantastic garden bug. They're an unrecognized hero as far as I am concerned. Orthoptera, these are grasshoppers and crickets. The musicians, okay? and they're really important food for birds and other animals. And this is also why a lot of them are really wonderful at disguising themselves. And on the left, that was out in the desert, and that grasshopper was keeping an eye on me um, and, and just not moving. Okay? So I was able to take some good photos of it. And on the right here, we have katydid. And katydids are actually omnivores, by the way, and they will eat insect eggs and some other things. They are rarely uh, so abundant as to create a problem. Okay. Mantises not related to grasshoppers. I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. They are more closely related to cockroaches and termites, okay? And you know, if you turn one of those Madagascan hissing cockroaches over, you can kind of see that relationship. But um, at any rate, our native species are the best. Um, the ones that you buy as an egg case tend to be the Chinese mantids. They're bigger than ours, they compete with them. And, um, you know, these will also show up in your garden if you have a nice, abundant garden with lots of prey. They're generalist predators, so they're going to catch the good stuff and the bad stuff. They're as likely to catch a bee as they are to catch a blowfly. They're pretty cool, though. I used to keep them as pets when I was little, and my mom let them hang out on the windowsill in the kitchen. Uh, I had a good mom. Um, <laughs> so lace wings are one of the few insects that are actually worth introducing to your garden if you don't already have a lot of them. You'll see the adults on flowers oftentimes. Um, the larvae look like little alligators, a little bit like um, ladybug larvae, right? but in pale green, pale brown colors. So these are a good one. You can buy them as eggs or as larvae or as adults and release them and you will have them in your garden henceforth. The ground crew and beyond. This is one of my favorite spiders here, the little jumpers, okay? They don't build webs in your house. We actually have a pet spider, Boris. He lives with us up in Walla Walla. And um, 
open the window. He hasn't left yet, so he's finding food. Anyway, these are kind of the non-insect vertebrates that I want to briefly um, introduce you to. So they have more legs than insects, generally speaking. This is a millipede on the left and a centipede on the right. And much like the other, like the darkling beetle and the um, carabid that I was mentioning, the one on the left is a vegetarian. Right? Millipede moves slow generally eats decomposing material. Occasionally, we'll find millipedes eating some flowers or some leaves, and oftentimes that's because uh, all the litter that they would like to have has been raked up. Centipede on the right here is a hunting predator and moves really fast, and yes, they'll sting. Don't pick them up. Bite. They bite. I've been corrected. Okay, you're going to tell us what they do, Bob. They bite. Bite here. Okay. Bite here, sting there. And, um, and I believe that the, what they're biting you with, right, aren't those modified legs, modified front legs. Centipedes are really cool. Okay. Be kind. Spiders. So most spiders are really great to have in gardens. We're even finding out that there's micro spiders that are really useful predators in vineyards, okay? Really small spiders that you probably have not noticed. Um, this is a green lynx spider on the left. And um, I was just talking to some folks at the Atlanta Botanic Garden who said, oh, the green lynx spiders, they've discovered that they like to hang out in the Saracenia, the pitcher plants and that they are capturing a moth that's a pest. And so they've started to manage to increase the population of green lynx spiders. This is a crab spider over here on the right. And they will never be so abundant that they're creating a problem in your garden. They do hang out on flowers, and yes, they probably catch a bee once in a while. Um, I actually took that photograph at Hastings Reserve. I posted it on Facebook. And I got a message saying, where on earth did you see that? That's a really unusual spider. Yes. <laughs> so um, it's also beautiful. So I have an appreciation for spiders. And you should too. Um, so here we are, the high and low vertebrates. There are plenty we don't want in our garden. I personally do not welcome deer into my garden. Um, and they have very different habitat needs than a lot of the insects, right? They, water features are good, they need shelter, uh, brush piles, rocks, logs, um, and the habitats, like I said, is going to be more of the topic of my next book. I, you know, as I went through writing this, I was really trying to introduce people to these organisms, and there's always a little bit about, like, here's what they eat, and here are some plants that are good. But there's so much more to say about developing good habitat in a garden. Native plants. Native plants leads to more insects, leads to more birds, leads to happiness. Now amphibians are really sensitive to pesticides, yet another great reason to not use pesticides, right? Frogs and toads eat lots of bugs and slugs. And um, should you be so lucky as to have a toad, take good care of them. We had a toad once somebody gave me, and they'd found it somewhere, and we released him into what we called our jungle room. It was kind of a little laugh house, and we had a hammock in there. We used to put a CD on that was uh, Sounds of the Rainforest. And as soon as the deluge started, Mr. Toad would hop out, you know, looking for the rain. We, we watered him. Yeah. Reptiles, this is um, our only native turtle here. And then these are the blue belly lizards that you may be lucky enough to have some of these blue belly uh, western fence lizards in your garden. Most of us don't have our western pond turtle. Birds. Now birds, of course, do nibble some plants. I've lost more than one row of peas to hungry birds. But generally speaking, we do welcome them, and you know, bird bath is good always. 
what can you do? Put up a bat house. Plant natives, I might have mentioned that. Okay. Be observant. Okay. Here is, over here, this is on live oak, um, and um, those are our stick insect. Okay. We have the longest coastline, some of the biggest trees, everything in California is, is the most and the biggest and the tallest and the deepest. And then we have this puny little stick insect. Yeah. Um, and they're rarely seen. They're very well camouflaged. So take a look around. Okay. Visit gardens. This is a great way to find plants. Okay. If this, this, this is one of my favorite plants here for beneficial. It kind of attracts hordes of butterflies and flies and bees. And if I was in a garden somewhere and walking around, it's a sunny day, I would see lots of insects visiting this. I would think, hmm, I think I'm going to add that to my garden. And so you don't need to know that much about which plants to plant. Okay? I often say Asteraceae, daisy family, right? And you were mentioning en Encelia, right? Is that it? Encelia. A fantastic plant here uh, for beneficials. This is another, this is heterophica, this is uh, another daisy family plant. Wonderful. Okay. okay. Be an example. And I often think when I'm thinking about be an example, plant some of these things in your front yard. Okay. People will often say, I want to plant a habitat garden, and they put it in the backyard. Okay. Neighbors don't see it. No one notices what you're doing. Put it in the front yard okay? and encourage your neighbors to do the same. Yeah. There's another, this was a winery, Leaping Frog Winery or something. And, and they planted for habitat. Here's a swimming pool, right? All native plants around the swimming pool. Okay. And then here are some heads daisy heads again. Okay. And by the way, if you're concerned about like, well, my front yard's going to look kind of messy, then my neighbors will be unhappy. Um, there are a lot of organizations now through which you can get signage, right? Pollinator garden, you know, or, you know, insect habitat. And stick one up there, you know, be out there in your front yard to talk to your neighbors about what you're doing. So Master Gardeners, this is one of the very largest organizations of volunteers in the entire country. I was amazed to discover this and each state is different. They are doing wonderful work of great value. Now uh, this is a great organization with which to volunteer your time. Okay. Join or volunteer. Botanic Garden, Native Plant Society. <laughs> Yay! Um, school gardens need you. Uh -huh. Yeah, join iNaturalist. How many of you are on the iNaturalist app? Okay, oh, quite a few people. Wonderful. Um, so one of the cool things about insects is you can be a total amateur and you can discover new species, but you could also um, simply see things out of their normal range. And this woman here, Bonnie Nickel, um, I think she's got over 4,000 uh, entries now. She's from the San Diego area and she spotted this insect, the northern plushback, out of its normal range in San Diego. So very exciting. Um, iNaturalist.org and also I put on here bugguide.net which is a great way to, uh, both of these can help you get things identified. Okay, So um, I may not be able to help you identify things, by the way. Turn off your lights at night. Okay? Um, if you want to know more about all the reasons why, you can actually tell we are way too lit up at night if you're a nocturnal insect or animal. Um, darksky.org is a wonderful organization working for dark skies. I think Anza Borrego is one of the dark sky spots, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Plant natives. Right. I love this uh, oak tree on the right, totally dominated this landscape. Um, it was on a, a tour I went on in the um, San Francisco Bay Area. 
And that tree was such a dominant feature in the landscape, and they, they ended up having to plant their whole garden right, to accommodate this live oak. It was wonderful. Right. This is the quote I live by. This is the meadow at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Uh, if you haven't visited and you're going up that way, um, please do go. It's a wonderful garden. Um, when we tug at a single thing in nature, we find it attached to the rest of the world. Oh, and then here's this book. Um, I was, <laughs> yay. I cannot tell you, I was beyond honored to have Doug Tallamy actually write a blurb for the back of my book because when he did that, I thought, oh my gosh, he actually took the time to read my book and then thought it was okay to endorse it. So um, I was thrilled. I have a Facebook page. I'm somewhat active there. That's why I said I may not be able to identify your insect. That's not what that page is for. I'm on Instagram, not as much as I should be, according to my son. And um, then I have a website I'm developing. It hasn't been quite launched yet, gardenallies.com, where I can write about um, some of the things that I did not have room for in the book. <laughs>